Welcome to the Sustainable Consumption Teaching Series. My name is Halina Brown. I'm Professor of Environmental Science and Policy at Clark University in, in the US. Today I would like to address the following question. Can public policy foster more sustainable consumption in ordinary human lives? It is customary to express consumption in the units of carbon footprint or uh, carbon emissions or carbon equivalent emissions. So these are the units I will be using. So how do we consume? We consume in the way we choose our homes to live. The size of these homes, the construction of these homes, the location of these homes, because that determines the community within, within we live and the norms of lifestyles that this community adopts. The location of our homes determines our mobility needs, access to life amenities. We also consume through the modes of transportation we choose, the food we eat. There is a big difference between uh, beef or otherwise flesh-based diet and vegetarian diet. We, we consume by buying stuff to fill up our homes, electronics, furniture, and so on. And, of course, services and leisure time. The restaurants, the travels on vacation, and so on. So this all adds up. I call it a lifestyle choice. It all adds up to our personal or our family's footprint. So let me start with venerable equation. We call it iPad equation. Most of you have seen it. It was introduced sometime in the 1970s by Holdren and Ehrlich, two scientists, one physicist, one ecologist in the US. And basically what this very simple equation says is that the impact, in other words, carbon emissions, is a product of the size of the population, the affluence of this population, and the type of technology that we use. So I'm not talking about the population today. I want to focus only on these two uh, terms, especially affluence. So we've been trying for decades to try to reduce the impacts by improving technology, efficiency. And we have found that Though efficiency improvements are very helpful, they are no match for our consumption practices, in other words, affluence. And what's interesting is that the more affluent we are, the bigger our carbon footprint. And this correlation calls across different countries, different cultures, different geographic locations in the world. And it looks something like that. This, this graph, I took from some US data. And it shows here, this is income and this is carbon footprint. And what it shows is it relentlessly go up with our income and at some point it begins to go uh, much more uh, supralinearly up because people in the top, ten, for example, 2% of income, their income is going very fast up, so their carbon footprint goes up. This is some numbers. Let me give you some numbers. People in the top 10% of income, which is say, let's call it here, 10%, people in this category take home 45% of all the income generated in, in the US. Right? So they take a very big chunk of income, they consume 25% of energy, which means they are not consuming as fast as their enormous incomes allow them. Right? What happens with the, let's say, the bottom 40%, they take in 10% income, these are poor people, and they consume 20% energy, which means that much bigger chunk of their personal budget is going on energy than among the super rich. Okay, 
So policies have been proposed how to reduce consumption overall. One of the most popular ones is carbon tax. Carbon tax essentially increases the price of energy and assumes that as a result everybody will use less energy. Now it also recognizes that when we do that people in this category will suffer the most because energy represents a big chunk of their income. They cannot afford to pay more. So there are different types of carbon tax proposals, but they all have some kind of redistributive uh, element that some of the money that's collected for this, uh, from these taxes is going to be given to people in this category of income so they do not suffer the effects of, of uh, increased cost of energy while everybody else hopefully will reduce their consumption. Right? Let's think about it for a moment. What might be the effects of that? We take is it going to affect people in this top income category? I already told you that they take 45% of all the national income, but they spend only 25% of all national energy. They can afford to pay much, much, much more for energy. They are not going to reduce their energy consumption. What will happen to the poor? We're going to take some of the money and give it to them to offset the suffering they are experiencing as a result of increased prices. What are they going to do with this money? Well, what we know is that the more income you have, the bigger your consumption is. So it's not clear at all that it's going to reduce consumption in the bottom. So what do we do, the wise policymakers? What do we do? We have to think in a much more informed way and clever way about policies. But we have to account for these different income categories in order to come up with clever policies. My proposal, reduce the income of the top by imposing highly progressive taxes. Don't tax energy, tax their income. Push these people into this category, and in these categories, they will feel the effects of carbon tax, possibly. What do we do with these people? Instead of giving them cash, let's design a society that provides them with dignified life and all the amenities, access to good education, access to social services, access to, <coughs> sorry, to decent housing, um, access to opportunities in life, and a job that preserves dignity. That's what they need. It's not the cash. It's putting them in a society in a way that they can lead a dignified life. What about those in the middle? I don't know. There are, this is a very heterogeneous group. There are high cultural capital people here, low cultural capital. There are the millennials who are experimenting with different lifestyles and so on. So I will leave you essentially, you, with an assignment, a research assignment. Figure out what opportunities we have here, depending on the aspirations, and lifestyle of people in this group. There is a whole group of millennials in the US that wants to ditch the suburban lifestyles, which is very high energy lifestyle, move to the cities. We should enable them to raise families in the cities. That means parks, good schools, affordable housing. The great cities of the world have an unaffordable housing right now right now. <clears throat> so these are the time. so for that group this we could do. So we need to have policies that support the existing trends already. And this is your job between now and your next module to figure it out. Thank you.